Alex Norasta, you are the Director of Immigration Studies at the Cato Institute Center for Global Liberty and Prosperity. Your writings have been published in the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, the Washington Post, and most major publications in the United States. And you regularly appear on Fox News, NS, NBC, Bloomberg, NPR, and now the Alain Guillot podcast. Thank you so much for being here. And finally, you just co-wrote a book called Rich, Richard Refuse, with a question mark, The Political Economy of Immigration and Institutions. Alex, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real honor to be here. Okay, so Alex, I went to your link, LinkedIn background and I saw that almost every job that you have had is related to immigration. So I can see that's the topic that you are passionate about. I wonder if you could start with a little bit of your background information. When you were in high school, did you think you would be working in immigration or what plans do you have for the future at that time? I had no idea I would work in immigration when I was in high school. Uh, when I was in high school, I wanted to work in finance. I wanted to work in investment banking. And I had a little bit of experience with that um, in college, working in finance and shortly after, the, after college. And that convinced me that I wanted uh, nothing to do with finance ever again. Um, that, that those jobs are just not for me. Um, and so I, I had the for me anyway, is the stupid idea of going to law school. And, um, you know, in the period of time between going to law school and, you know, quitting my current job, I, I had some, some time, some free time. So I decided to intern at a few think tanks. And some of them allowed me to do some work on the topic of immigration if I wanted to. And that's basically how I got started, totally by accident. Okay, uh, in the topic of finance, uh, it happened to me the same thing. I study finance, I work as a financial advisor, and I discovered I didn't want anything to do with it. Uh, I, the reason for my case is because we charge exorbitant rates to clients who don't know any better. I wonder what was your your reason for not wanting to do anything with finance? I mean, it was just not uh, as enjoyable a job as I thought it would be. I, I think I'd been a little influenced by media, by by television, by depictions of finance as being sort of a, a very, uh, that, that every financial job is sort of very important, that uh, it's all really interesting. And in my experience, it really wasn't. It wasn't that interesting. And I really need a job where I'm excited to wake up every day and go to the office uh, in order to keep me sort of happy. And I, I just was not getting that kind of satisfaction from a job in finance. So it's no, you know, I didn't have any disagreements with finance as an institution, right? I didn't have any moral problems with it or moral qualms, uh, but it just wasn't fun to me. It wasn't interesting. And, um, you know, by luck, when I was interning at these think tanks between quitting my finance job and going to law school, I uh, sort of found something that I love because my background was in economics. That was my undergraduate degree. And immigration is really just uh, a topic that touches on so many aspects of economics and social science. Um, it's so interesting, especially in the United States and other countries too, but especially in the United States, that uh, it really made me happy to wake up every morning and happy to go into the office. And in my experience, if you're happy with your job and happy to wake up in the morning to go into the office, that's like the ha the height of success in your career. And Can so you I describe? Can you describe exactly what is it that makes you happy? I mean, from my perspective of not knowing anything about immigration, I guess you will sit in an office to see thousands and thousands of applications, and then you will decide yes or not. So I'm sure I have a very narrow view of what is, what is your job like. Can you describe it in more detail? What are those instances that make you happy to get up in the morning? Yeah, so I mean, I, I'm not the person accepting or denying applications, right? I'm basically studying the effect of immigration on the United States and other countries. I'm studying how immigration affects the economy, 
uh, affects culture, affects political and economic institutions, and then trying to make the case that the United States should allow more immigrants into the United States. So I'm not one of those guys stamping the visas. I'm not one of the immigration attorneys uh, working for immigrants or working for companies or their sponsors to try to bring them in. I'm merely doing sort of the, um, the, the, the much less impactful <laughs> work on, uh, you know, studying how immigration affects the country and then uh, trying to make the case based on my findings that we should have more of it. Okay. Do you know how Americans get around the idea that the only Native American, the only people from the U.S. are Native Americans and everybody else is an immigrant? Uh, you and I don't know, the most pro or against immigration person in the United States, there are also immigrants. <laughs> I mean, unless they are oh, Native Americans, everybody else is an immigrant. Yeah, I mean, we're all, um, you know, that's one of the unique things about the United States and a few other countries, right? I think like Canada, Australia, New Zealand, a few other countries, um, you know, in the Western Hemisphere as well, have, you know, relatively recent um, populations. You know, prior, you look, you look back at North America 500 years ago, and the demographics were radically different. They were all basically Native Americans uh, living here, a handful of Europeans at the time, mainly from Spain. Um, and so over the course of the intervening 500 years, uh, we've had a tremendous influx of people from, from Europe, from Asia, from Africa, uh, coming to these shores. And then they've had subsequent generations of people born here, uh, you know, who are, who are native born. Uh, but we can all trace our ancestry back at least a few hundred years to when somebody was either brought here against their will or was brought here or, or who came voluntarily to these shores um, as immigrants. So we, we do have like an immigrant society. Um, and what, what's unique though about us and other, some other countries like this is we can remember um, some of our ancestors who came here. Some of us, you know, I've taken a look at our ancestry through Ellis Island when they entered the United States or even before then. To come here. So we know some, in some cases the names of our specific ancestors who came here. Uh, migration, of course, though, is a, is a human, a universal human experience. Um, you know, humans, Homo sapiens, uh, evolved first in Saharan Africa um, and then spread through migrations around the world over the course of like 200,000 years from, you know, Saharan Africa to Europe to Asia to Australia to North America. Um, South America. So while Native Americans uh, may not remember their specific ancestors who came across the land bridge from Asia to North America um, several thousands of years ago, um, even they are the products of migration. It's just that it's continuing today in, in a slightly different way. Okay. And do you know, in the pro, in the present America, in the present modern America, at what time in history do native or people from the United States decide to label themselves as American and everybody else coming from that moment on as immigrants? Yeah, so that's a difficult, that's a difficult question to try to answer. Um, the U.S. government, and um, I believe it was 1850 on the U.S. census, um, separated people by whether they were native born or foreign born and then came to these shores um, sort of as part of the data collection of the U.S. Census. Uh, prior to that, in 1820, the U.S. government um, asked or, or demanded that shipping companies uh, who were bringing people over to the United States uh, basically register all of the new people who wanted to live here um, at a customs official office at the ports where they were landing. Uh, and I have no doubt that prior to that, when you, have, when you take a look at sort of the debates over the American Constitution in the late 18th century, uh, you had folks like John Jay and Thomas Jefferson um, and others talk about immigrants, talk about migrants, talk about people who weren't born in the United States at the time uh, who were coming over here. Uh, and they were, they were talking about them. They were talking about how their proper role fits into the Constitution. So I'm pretty sure this distinction uh, goes back even further than that. So just the distinction between people who are born here, uh, you know, who are, you know, quote, native, unquote, native born, 
um, and those who were born abroad and decided to come over here probably goes back to the very beginning, probably the first or second generation of English or Spanish settlers um, who are here um, in the new world. So I, I don't think it's anything new. I just think maybe the language that we use to describe it uh, has changed a lot over time. Right. And through our history of the United States, there have been wave of immigrants, Irish, Italians, Germans, Jews, Chinese, and all of them have uh, encountered some resistance. We don't want you here. We don't want new immigrants. And of course, now they are part of the structure of the United States. And now they are the ones calling for no more immigration. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, you know, the, the joke that people say, right, is that um, when an immigrant group and its descendants become fully assimilated, that's when they argue for closing the door behind them. Um, you know, when they become fully Americanized, right, fully integrated in American society, that's when they don't want any more immigration like themselves. You know, they, they say something like, um, uh, I don't want any more immigrants to let in people like my ancestors, right? And when you, when you ask folks, about this today, like the descendants of Italian or Irish or English or other immigrants, uh, they say, oh, yeah, well, it was different back then. You know, my ancestors behaved differently. And it's like, well, how do you know? And it's like, oh, well, I just assume that it's true. When you look at the social science, you know, it's really not true. Um, you know, immigrants have behaved pretty similarly over time in the United States. They come in, they have, you know, different customs, different cultures, often different languages. Um, and it takes a little while to sort of integrate into the fabric of American society, for them to become sort of more American, and also for the Americans who are here to accept them and to accept their religions, to accept their culture. I mean, there was a time in American history when being Catholic was viewed as sort of less than American. It was viewed as sort of an alien religion that was not really part of the fabric of Protestant North America. And now when you say something like that, it's just like, it's ridiculous. Like, of course, Catholics can be American. Like, who, who doubts that? Um, but now there's some resistance among some people that says, oh, while well, you're a little less American if you're Muslim, or you're a little less American if you're part of this other religion. And I have no doubt that in a few generations, after, you know, Muslim immigrants and their descendants and their kids' kids, you know, assimilate and integrate even better than they already are, that that view is going to be seen as sort of antiquated and old and just, uh, you know, patently at odds with, a, with what it means to be an American. So, so in that sense, right, like immigrants assimilate and integrate into what it means to be American. But the definition of what it means to be American also grows to accept all these different people and their customs as part of our country. And uh, how many generations does it take for a... Um for a family of immigrants to assimilate. And um, I'll just let you know, I have a daughter in the United States. She's, she lives in Hawaii. And she hardly, sp I'm, and I'm from South America, I'm from Colombia. And she hardly speaks any Spanish anymore, just for a few greetings words. And now we have, I have a grand grandson there, and I'm sure he's not going to speak any Spanish <laughs> unless he goes to school too. <laughs> so I'm sure by this, his generation, uh, he will be 100%, I don't know, assimilated uh, U.S. Uh, American, and he will probably not recognize his own uh, background as a Colombian in my case. Yeah, you know, that's probably right. Um, you know, it really depends on the different immigrant groups. But when we talk about assimilation, what economists generally take a look at is whether the immigrant or his descendants are similar, how similar they are to other longer settled Americans on the aspects of like income, education, family size and fertility, whether they volunteer, for whom they volunteer, for whom they vote, um, uh, and, and linguistic ability. And when we take a look at that, um, it's basically on average three generations. So the first generation is the immigrant, The second are the immigrant's kids born here, and the third are the grandkids. And when you take a look at something like uh, the Pew uh, does surveys about this, uh, the Pew Research Center, and they ask third-generation folks in Los Angeles whether they are, you know, if they're the descendants of Hispanic immigrants from Central and South America, 
and they ask, do you speak Spanish, yes or no? And the third generation, um, 100% speaks English. 22% claim to speak Spanish as being bilingual. But I bet that if you were to talk to them, you would find their accent to be very thick, very American, and to be uh, not very good, frankly, not very good Spanish. Like my, my father, who was born in the United States, an immigrant from Iran, my father claims to be bilingual. He claims to speak Farsi. But as far as I can tell, he speaks Farsi like he's four years old, and he speaks it with a thick Wisconsin accent. And I don't speak any Farsi at all. So I, you know, I think that the, the description of that, you know, that, that you've talked about with, with your daughter and your grandson and your grandkids and, and, you know, what's happened with the uh, grandkids of, you know, my grandparents in terms of assimilation with me um, is the pretty typical tale. It takes about three generations. Wow. Uh, okay, so let me ask you about this book. Uh, first, what inspired you to write this book? Uh, who is your co-author and what can the listeners uh, hope to find in this book? So what inspired me to write this book was a new argument that we were hearing against immigration. So I'm very pro-immigration, pro-expanding legal immigration. And most of the arguments are about things like immigrants are going to take their jobs or immigrants are going to increase crime. And the research on that is very solid, very one-sided. Basically, immigrants don't take your jobs. They don't increase crime. But we started to hear this new argument that immigrants are coming here from poor countries. They come here from countries with poor, bad economic institutions. Um, and they might spread those economic institutions here and make the United States poor. And what I mean by economic institutions are sort of like the rules of economic exchange in the United States. You know, the rules of property rights, having low to moderate taxes, having a decent court system. And a lot of immigrants come from countries where they don't have those things. So maybe if enough of them come here, they could vote for bad public policies. They could vote for, you know, much higher taxes. They could vote for really bad laws. They could vote for a really bad court system. And as a result, that would make the United States a lot poorer and sort of undermine our prosperity. And we started to hear this argument come up. And in 2013, you know, my co-author Ben Powell and I uh, really started to take a look at this in detail. Um, ben is a uh, PhD economist who teaches at uh, Texas Tech University. And we sort of started to take a look at this argument because the economics of immigration are very good. They're solid. Immigration makes the United States wealthier, makes immigrants wealthier, uh, makes Americans wealthier. But if immigrants undermine our economic institutions, they could make us poorer in the long run. So we wrote an entire book investigating this. This is the first book on this specific topic ever, to, ever published, as far as we can tell, going back on this specific topic. And what we basically find is taking a look at all these different factors, from corruption to economic freedom to, to taxes to terrorism to its impact on culture, um, immigration does not make Americans or people in other countries poorer. It does not degrade their economic institutions. In fact, in most cases, it actually improves them. It actually makes the United States and other countries a little bit more economically free. It makes them more willing to exchange. And as a result, uh, all of these countries become, uh, you know, generally a little bit wealthier as a result of these immigrants. And of course, I'm sure you are uh, against the quote from President Trump that says Mexicans are bringing in drugs. They are bringing in crime. They are rapists, and some of them are good people, I guess. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, um, you know, there are 10, there, there are over 40 million immigrants in the United States. And if you have a group of people that large, you're going to have some bad people, no matter what, right? But the number of, of criminals amongst immigrants, immigrants are much less likely to be criminals you know, much less likely to be bad people, much less likely to be, you know, spreading and voting and supporting bad institutions in the United States. 
so it's you know it's it's almost reverse of the Donald Trump quote, right? Like most immigrants are very good people, um, and only a very small number are bad, um, and a much smaller percentage of immigrants are bad people than native-born Americans. And um, and do you know? Are you aware of any negative impact on immigration? I mean, I'm sure you have a lot of positive things to say, but have you found anything that you could point the finger and say, well, in this area, maybe immigration is not such a good thing? So there are some things where it's mixed, right? So um, you know, immigrants into an area, uh, they increase economic prosperity, jobs, and wages but they also increase the price of real estate. And so if you're like a sort of low, lower skilled uh, or middle skilled uh, American living in a major city where a lot of immigrants go, it's going to be more expensive for you to rent an apartment. It's going to be more expensive for you to buy a house. So, but that's something where it's mixed because for other native American Americans who own property, the value of their property goes up. Right. So that might be a little bit mixed. Um, in terms of terrorism, which is something we, I've taken a lot of look at, uh, foreign-born people in the United States are uh, more likely to be terrorists than native-born Americans. Um, but terrorism is so rare um, that it's really not that big of a deal. So to give you an example, right, your annual chance of being murdered by a native-born American who's a terrorist in a terrorist attack is about one in 20 million per year. Uh, sorry, one in 28 million per year. But your annual chance of being murdered by a foreign-born terrorist on U.S. soil and an attack is about one in four million per year. So you are more likely, but it's just the problem with that is the only reason why there's a difference there is just because of the 9-11 attacks, and that's it. And none of the 9-11 attackers were actually immigrants. They were here on tourist visas. They entered as tourists to, to attack Americans. So it depends how you slice and dice this number, but foreign-born people are probably a little bit more likely to be terrorists than native-born Americans, but terrorism is so rare, and the number of people killed in terrorism is so few uh, that it, it's not nearly as big a deal as it says. So, for instance, from 1975 to the end of 2017, about 800,000 Americans were murdered in normal homicides in the United States, 800,000. Meanwhile, the number of Americans killed in terrorist attacks is about 3,500. So you're talking about the number of people killed in terrorist attacks as being less than one half of 1% of the total number of people killed in, you know, homicides and murder. So terrorism is real. It's a threat. Uh, immigrants are probably more likely to be terrorists, but it's a pretty small and manageable threat, all things considered. So I'd say if I was to take a look at the impact of immigration on U.S. society, U.S. economy, Um, those are probably the two areas, you know, property prices going up and uh, terrorism, where immigrants are probably a little bit more negative than native. Right. Okay. And what are you suggesting? Are you suggesting that the United States should have an open door, everyone is welcome, or should they just open the door a little bit wider and accept a little bit more people than they are currently accepting right now? So I think if If we're just worried about sort of economics, if we're just worried about, um, I think the primary, the best policy for the United States would be to say, if you are not a criminal, if you are not a terrorist or a suspected terrorist or suspected criminal, and if you're healthy, then you should be able to immigrate to the United States legally. You should be able to work, live, and eventually become a citizen. Um, there are basically no economic and, as far as we can tell, social downsides to the United States to be able to do that. So I think that would sort of be the optimal policy. And that's a return, by the way, to what immigration policy was in the United States around the year 1875. Um, so I think that would be a very good thing for the United States. But if we can't go that far, right, which I admit is a fairly, um, you know, uh, extreme libertarian policy position, right, if we can't go that far, then expanding legal immigration in other ways, I think, is the way that um, would, would also be very, very positive for the United States. So expanding immigration okay. for low-skilled workers, mid-skilled workers, high-skilled workers, their family members, temporary workers who come and work in agriculture or in hotels or someplace else, you know, even any of these expansions would be pos po positive for the United States. 
but I think it would be best if we allowed anybody to come here and work so long as they were a safe person. Okay, so immigration was reduced drastically under the Trump administration. Do you think now under the new Biden administration it will be more liberal? I think it's going to move in that direction. I mean, it would be really hard to be more closed <laughs> than the Trump administration. Um, you know, in the second half of the year 2020, um, immigration to the United States uh, fell by about 90% legal immigration. It's sort of the most drastic one-year decline in legal immigration in U.S. history under the Biden, uh, under the Trump administration. And that's due, you know, in part to COVID-19, that's due in part to the economic recession by COVID and the rules that President Trump put in place to stop legal immigration. President Biden has promised to repeal most of these rules, to go back to expanded legal immigration, but he's going to have a lot of work to do to do that. He's going to have to repeal about 400 the 450 um, executive actions taken by President Trump to go back to the immigration levels that we had in 2016 under Obama. Um, so if he gets back to those, I will consider his administration to be a big achievement. However, he's going to have to go even further than that to expand legal immigration more than what Obama had. And that should be like the number one overriding goal of his administration. So there's a good chance he'll do that. But it's going to be hard to repeal all of these executive orders and actions that Trump put in place. Well, you know, it's hard to um, uh, see so much resistance to immigration when some of the idols of the United States are mostly immigrants. I, I mean, I think about the Google boys who are Russian, uh, the CEO of Microsoft, who is, I believe, Indian. Uh, the, uh, the CEO of Tesla, which I think he's from South Africa, uh, the CEO of General Motors, I think she's from Netherlands. So we have immigrants contributing so much to the to the U.S. economy, and it's hard to see uh, so much resistance. But I guess that's I mean that's what populism does. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's resistance for so many reasons. Um, you know, and and so many and the reasons just don't make a lot of sense and don't add up. Right. I think it just comes down to um, a lot of people have this sort of bias against foreign born people. And it's and it's in every country in the world. Right. It's not uniquely American. And I think we're probably less biased against immigrants here than most other countries. Um, and, and, the, and the issue is, right, people just don't like immigrants and they just make up all these reasons that don't make any sense. And so it's very frustrating for me, right? I'll be arguing with somebody. Like I'll go on Tucker Carlson's show and argue with him about immigrants. And he'll say, immigrants take jobs. And I'm like, that's not true. There's all this evidence that says otherwise. And he goes, yeah, but they're all criminals. And I say, well, they're not criminals. Look at this evidence. He goes, okay, but they don't learn English. And I say, well, they do learn English. Look at this. And he goes, well, they all vote for Democrats. And I'm like, they don't. Look at this. And he's like, well, and then he goes back to the first point, right? It's just like this circular <laughs> argument. Um, and it's hard to get in front of it. And so I think there's something deep that underlies it. And I think this sort of deep anti-immigration sentiment, this deep nativism, um, is something that goes to like the core of what it means to be a human being, unfortunately. And to the extent that we sort of try to reduce that negative aspect of our human nature of being nativist, of being xenophobic, is the extent to which we triumph and thrive as human beings and sort of reducing wow. nativism is something that will help us and our descendants uh basically just be better more productive and wealthier people wow okay well we have a lot to learn from your book alex i wonder if you could tell us one more time the name of your book where can people find it and where can people follow you yeah, so the name of the book is Wretched Refuse, The Political Economy of Immigration Institutions. It is available on uh, December 17th on Amazon, and it's written by myself, Alex Narasa, my co-author, Benjamin Powell. Well, Alex, thank you so much for being here with us. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity. I really appreciate it.